chapter 10, the spell begins to break. Now we must come go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said, there's no time to lose, everyone began bundling themselves into coats, except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table and said, now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down that ham and here's a packet of tea and there's sugar and some matches. And if someone will get two or three loaves of the crock over there in the corner. What are you doing? Mrs. Beaver exclaimed. Susan, packing a load for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Mrs. Beaver so coolly. You didn't think we'd set on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? But we haven't the time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any minute. That's what I say chimed in Mr. Beaver. Get along with all of you, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for a quarter of an hour at least. But we don't want, uh, but we want as big a start as we can possibly get, said Peter. If we're to reach the stone table before her, you've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she looked in here and finds we're all gone, she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver, but we can't get there before her, whatever we do, for she'll be on a sledge and we'll be walking. Then we have no hope, said Susan. No, now don't you get fussing there. There's a deer, said Mrs. Beaver, but just get a half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of the drawer. Of course, we've got hope. We can't get there before her, but we can keep undercover and go by ways she won't expect and perhaps we'll get through that's true enough mrs beaver said her husband but it's time we were out of this and don't you start fussing either mrs beaver said his wife there that's better there's five loads and the smallest is for the small of us that's you my dear she added looking at lucy oh do please come on said lucy well, I'm nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver, at last allowing her husband to help her into snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine is too heavy to bring. Yes, it is, said Mr. Beaver, a great deal too heavy. And you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose. I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it, as likely as not. Oh, please, please, please do hurry, said the three children. And so at last they all got outside, and Mr. Beaver locked the door. It'll delay her a bit, he said. And they all set off, all carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped, and the mood had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file, first Mr. Beaver, and then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, and Mrs. Beaver last of all. Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and on to the right bank of the river, then along a very rough sort of path along the trees right down by the river bank. The sides of the valley, shining in the moonlight, towered up far above them on either hand. Best keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't bring a sledge down here. It would have been a pretty enough scene to look at through a window from a comfortable armchair, and even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first. But as they went on walking and walking and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all. And she stopped, looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all its waterfalls of ice and all the white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars, and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pet 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 through the snow in front of her, as if they were never going to stop. Then the moon disappeared and the snow began to fall once more. And at last Lucy was so tired that she almost was almost asleep and walking at the same time when suddenly she found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the riverbank to the right and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest bushes. And then, as she came fully awake, she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank which had almost been hidden under the bushes until you were quite on top of it. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only his short, flat tail was showing. 
Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. Then she heard noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her. In a moment, all five of them were inside. "'Wherever is this?' said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. "'I hope you know what I mean by a voice sounding pale. "'It's an old hiding place for beavers in bad times,' said Mr. Beaver, "'and a great secret. "'It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep. "'If you hadn't all been so plaguely fuss when we started, "'I'd have brought some pillows for you,' said Mrs. Beaver." It wasn't nearly such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's, Lucy thought. Just a hole in the ground, but dry and earthy. It was very small, so that when they all lay down, they were a bundle of clothes together. And what with that and being warmed up by their long walk, they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mrs. Beaver handed round in the dark a little flask out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and sputter a little and it stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you'd swallowed it, and everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute, though really it was hours and hours later, when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff and thinking how she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a long set of whiskers tickling her cheek and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that, she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact, they were all sitting up with their mouths and their eyes wide open, listening to a sound which was the very sound they'd all been thinking of, and sometimes imagining they heard. During the walk last night, it was the sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing to do, but it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among the bushes and the brambles without being seen, and he wanted, above all things, to see which way the witch's sledge went. The others all sat in the cave, waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. Oh, thought Lucy, he's been seen. She's caught him. Great was their surprise when a little later they heard Mr. Beaver's voice calling them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs. Beaver, come out, sons and daughters of Adam. It's all right. It isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course, but that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia, in our world, they usually don't talk at all. So, Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight and with the earth all over them and looking very frousty and unbrushed and uncombed and with the sleep in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see. This is a nasty knock for the witch. It looks as if her power is already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr. Beaver, panted Peaver, panted Peter, as they scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together? Didn't I tell you, answered Mr. Beaver, that she's made it always winter and never Christmas? Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top and did see. It was a sledge, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness, but they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man with a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside, and a great white beard that fell like foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because, though you see people of this sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it is rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look old, only funny and jolly. But now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also very solemn. I've come at last, he said. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have got in the last. 
Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you only get if you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence. There's a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it in your house as I pass. If you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy. It's all locked up. Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home, you will find your dam finished and mended and all the leaks stopped with a new sluice gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents was the answer. They And they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color silver, and across it, were, across it there ramped a red lion as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold and had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you. And he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss. And when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then, wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy, Eve's daughter. And Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass, but people said afterward it was made of a diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a coral made of juice from one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends is hurt, a few drops of this will restore them. And the dagger is to defend yourself at great need, for you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I think, I don't know, but I think I could be brave enough. That's not the point. He said, but battles are ugly when women fight. And now, here, he suddenly looked less grave. Here is something for the moment, something for the moment for you all. And he brought out, I supposed from the big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it. A large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl, a lump of sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot all sizzling and piping hot. And he cried out, Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! And cracked his whip. And he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized that they had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of the sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand talking until the tea's got cold, just like men. Come and help to carry the tray down and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. So down the steep bank they went and back into the cave. And Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches. And Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea and everyone enjoyed themselves. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mr. Beaver said, Time to be moving on now. <laughs>